I'm not gonna lie, working in a security operations center or even just as a security analyst on a smaller team can be a very stressful job, especially the newer you are in the industry. And to make matters worse, you're probably always gonna be questioning things like, am I even doing this job right? Or did I miss something completely obvious? Or even things like, do I even know what I'm doing or am I just an imposter? And I'll be honest in that these are many of the same common sentiments that I first felt as I was getting into the industry and still even things that creep up to this day as I, you know, specialize in different areas or work in different fields, right? And to be honest, it's very tough, right? With so much to learn and pick up on the job, it can be easy to fall into common traps that, you know, impact your growth or uh, really just slow down your effectiveness as an analyst. And so in this video, I wanna cover some of the more common mistakes that I see junior analysts make, both from on the job experience, right? Directly working with them, but also from a pedagogy perspective as well. Managing privileged access is one of the toughest challenges in cybersecurity today. Every organization needs a way to seamlessly secure and manage access to critical resources like credentials, servers, web apps, databases, and workloads. But it's tough with today's environments that have both legacy platforms and modern cloud infrastructure. And that's where today's sponsor comes in with Keeper Pam. And I've had the chance to play around with it myself as well. And I gotta say, it's pretty impressive. The platform is powerful, it's intuitive, and it fits seamlessly into any tech stack. Keeper Pam gives you complete visibility, security, and control over every user and device within your organization. Whether you're working across multi-cloud environments, on-prem systems, or remote workloads, Keeper Pam has you covered with features like passwordless access to all infrastructure, even for machines that don't natively support it, automatic password rotation to lock down service accounts, manage privileged sessions across any protocol like RDP or SSH, MySQL, and much more and the ability to eliminate standing privileges with just-in-time access. Whether it's managing privileged sessions, tunneling into SSH clients and database management tools, or securing multi-cloud environments, it just works. Keeper are FedRAMP and StateRAMP authorized, ISO certified, zero knowledge, and the list keeps going on. If you want to find out more, head over to keeper.io slash TCM, or check the link in the description below. You know, I've trained thousands of analysts, and so I've seen uh, you know, some of these bad habits forming in real time, so I have an interesting perspective there to share, an ability to offer my hand at correcting them, right? And of course, we're gonna talk about how we can either completely avoid or certainly mitigate many of these common mistakes or habits as well. And so let's dive right in. To start off here, I wanna talk about arguably the most important aspect or responsibility of our role as an analyst, and that's to perform the investigation, right? When an alert comes in, typically it's our goal as an analyst to identify what events led up to that alert, right? And also investigate what occurred after the alert. And ultimately, determine whether that series of events collectively represents something malicious or benign, right? Evil or good. And this is sort of the catalyst that kicks off and guides our investigation, right? But as much as performing investigations is a science, it's also kind of an art. One of the biggest things that separates an expert analyst from a more inexperienced one is their ability to form relevant, actionable, and specific questions that helps drive the investigation and push you in a right direction, right? This not only helps you when you're getting stuck, but also allows you to more efficiently and effectively use the data that you have available to you to form meaningful conclusions. And the most common mistake I see here are analysts asking questions that are too broad or not specific enough or are not meaningful or relevant enough, right? If you ask an all-encompassing general question, well, the answers you get are gonna be very all-encompassing and general as well, right? You're not gonna get specific answers that drive the investigation in a meaningful way. And I think this is best explained with an example, right? So let's say we've received an alert like this for some potential command and control communication. Now, this is a real alert rule that I pulled out and simplified for our scenario, but we don't really have to worry about how it was generated or written. But usually our investigation starts with some sort of intake like this or an initial observation or alert like we see here. And a bad habit of newer analysts is that whenever they see something like this, they automatically assume the worst case scenario and start getting ahead of themselves, especially as it relates to different phases of the attack chain, right? So, you know, if we see that a system communicated with a potential command and control server, well, you know, they might think, oh, we've definitely been compromised. So we should go look for back doors or evidence of exfiltration. This line of questioning isn't particularly relevant to what we've been presented with from our alert, right? And that's not to say we might not discover evidence of these things like backdoors or exfiltration as we continue our investigation, but that's a key point, right? We want to use what we've seen based on our alert or evidence that we've already found and then form relevant questions based on those findings, right? So in this case, we appear to be dealing with a suspicious web request to this endpoint within the alert, right? So we should focus on gathering details related to that before we start hopping all over the place. The other common mistake I see, again, questions that are not specific enough. 
So when we look at an alert like this, one of the common questions we might ask or think about is, well, is this malicious, right? Is this malicious command and control or C2 communication? Well, obviously we want to figure that out, right? That's sort of the crux or the end goal of our investigation. But that's more like, again, an end goal that we arrive to rather than a question that's going to lead us down a useful path, right? What can we do with questions like that, right? Is it malicious? That's sort of a binary answer. We can't just jump into a specific piece of evidence and arrive to that conclusion. We need to break down that question a bit and ask more specific questions, right? More actionable questions that allow us to actually do something with the data or evidence that we have in order to find the answer. And setting up questions in this way means that we only need to work with a smaller pool of evidence or data to figure out what we're looking for, right? So instead of asking things like, was this malicious or was that IP address malicious? We might ask things like, what was the domain name associated with this connection? In that case, we know that we're looking for a domain name so we can look at specific log sources like the web proxy logs or DNS logs or even a packet capture if we have that available to us to map that IP to a domain, right? Maybe we're even looking at passive DNS lookups and doing some more OSINT to figure that out. From there, we might ask, you know, when was that domain registered or who owns the domain? or what is the reputation of this domain name or IP address, right? Uh, or even things like what was the refer of that HTTP request? Same kind of deal, right? We want to know what led up to that event. Or even things like what process made the request, right? So we can sort of tie things into the endpoint as well. And this is really only scratching the surface, right? There are so many other questions or directions that we can go, especially as we start answering some of these questions and gaining more evidence. But fortunately, both issues of, you know, having non-relevant or non-specific questions can really be solved just by taking a step back and, you know, first making sure that we interpret the meaning of what the alert is telling us before we dive in. If we take a look at the alert again, we can start to break down what it's actually telling us, right? And so in this case, we can see that a request was made to that call URL.php endpoint. We can also interpret or infer that the user agent for that connection was IE9, which is possibly a benign user agent, right? That could be referring to Internet Explorer 9, or it could also be a signature of that malware's HTTP request, right? Because that's not a typical user agent that we might see in our logs, right? So this in introduces a whole other line of questioning, right? More specific questioning like, you know, when was this user agent first seen in our environment? Or what data was received from that URL endpoint, right? So again, this might be harder to source depending on the data sources that we have, but it's a good pivot point, right? Ultimately, forming these actionable specific questions early on is a useful skill that's really gonna help you avoid getting stuck in rabbit holes. So let's sort of remember that methodology as we start to think about how we can contextualize different events holistically, right? Because another common mistake that I see analysts make is that they look at individual events or dispositions in a vacuum. And what I mean by that is they're forgetting to think about how one event that they've discovered can fit into a larger timeline. Because that's also what we're really trying to do as we investigate. We're trying to rebuild and recreate that timeline of events so we can determine that, again, if all of those events collectively represent something malicious or benign. For example, let's say we have a scenario where we've been alerted on a strange file download. And so at first, we don't really know where this event fits in on the timeline. We just know that it happened. And so we need to investigate that initial event more thoroughly. What characteristics or relationships can we draw from it? And along the process of doing that, we might come across an earlier event where we found the process execution of PowerShell.exe. And maybe we find out that that PowerShell executable was spawned by WinWord.exe or Microsoft Word. Now, if we zoom out, we can start to look at things more holistically and consider this new finding's relevance. Maybe we can correlate that process that made the HTTP request was in fact PowerShell, and we can link the two there. Maybe it was the same process. Going back even further, maybe we zoom out some more and discover that the user in question was phished earlier this morning, and they received a macro-enabled Word document. Right, so as we zoom out, all of this starts to come together. We're piecing together this attack timeline. Lastly, and of course this is not the complete picture here, but just for example, maybe we discover a number of alerts after the file download that indicate that file extensions are being changed rapidly on the system, right? And so again, as we zoom back out and think more holistically, what does this mean in relation to all of the other things that I know? Sure, you know, some of these events were not silver bullets on our own. They did not tell us the complete story in a vacuum. But as we piece together the timeline, well, this looks a whole lot like a potential ransomware scenario. Right? And so hopefully you can see here what I mean. The, you know, the key takeaway is that we're not getting lost or falling down rabbit holes by refusing to take a step back and consider what we have. You know, the best analysts visualize the timeline in their head as they go through their investigation and sort of mentally piece together what goes where and even forecast what may or may not have happened yet. And so next, I want to talk about this idea of abstraction and how sometimes the data sources that we have and the way that they're sort of parsed or constructed or logged or presented can sort of obfuscate what the data actually means or what it's telling us. 
And sometimes analysts rely too heavily on what their tools or outputs are telling them, and that can lead to, again, some unintentional rabbit holes or sometimes introduce bias. For example, we often see abstraction take form in some common fields like usernames, for example, right? Computers are smart, but they can't physically determine whether it's Bob Smith authenticating to their machine or if it's his next door neighbor that simply knows Bob's password, right? And so this comes back to why we can't just look at single events in a vacuum. There's always gonna be some sort of abstraction between the username and the actual user who's performing actions. And now we can think of thousands of examples here, but why don't we also think about it in the physical realm, right? Like for example, a badge scanner in the lobby of an office building. Well, let's say when, you know, we have Bob who scans in every day or every morning, and every time Bob scans the door with his ID card, he leaves a log similar to this one that you can see here. And even with such a small abstraction like this, this also introduces room for mistakes and misattribution, right? So for example, maybe we're investigating a data exfiltration incident that actually started from an unauthorized person entering the building. And maybe we're combing through the access logs to answer the question of, you know, who entered the building around the time that the data was collected. Well, if we see this log entry and ignore the element of abstraction, we might assume that it's just Bob, right? So it couldn't have been related. And maybe an attacker actually stole or cloned Bob's key card, right? Or maybe it was in fact Bob himself and he's the insider threat here. The point is, we need to remember that what we see in the data versus what actually happened, you know, this idea of perception versus reality is not always equivalent, right? Sometimes logs are parsed incorrectly or fields that we thought we could trust blindly, of course, need to be verified, right? And so to avoid missing important details due to abstraction, we need to cross-reference our findings with other data points. Say, for example, we also had security footage of the lobby during that time, right? Well, in that case, we could visually correlate and identify if it was or not, in fact, Bob who buzzed in. And so lastly, this is something I'm gonna continue to stress until the day I die, and that's documentation, right? And writing good, proper, cohesive, and helpful documentation. Unfortunately, as obvious and as easy as it sounds, Writing poor documentation is a mistake that I've seen all throughout my career, right? and I've had plenty of unfortunate experiences working with colleagues that just leave terrible or sometimes no or zero documentation on tickets or within reports or case notes, right? And it's just not something that I think should be acceptable in any mature SOC. You don't know how hard it is to go back, you know, six months down the road on a ticket and have no idea what took place or what was done or if anything is outstanding or missing, right? Or if any actions were even taken. And so you should take pride in your note-taking ability, right? And you should leave descriptive, action-oriented notes all throughout your investigation. Communication is one of, if not the most important soft skill in our industry. And so our notes should be detailed enough so that another analyst can come by six months down the road and retrace our steps and, you know, hopefully arrive at the same conclusion. We need to be able to justify how we took specific actions and why. And so what does this look like in practice? Well, let's take a look at this bad example for starters, right? So for example, let's say we have a ticket of a suspicious PowerShell script execution uh, where we have some base 64 encoded commands that were detected, right? And in this case, the analyst here just marked this as a false positive and immediately closed the ticket. So for such a scary sounding alert, this documentation almost tells us nothing. It doesn't explain what happened or what actions the analyst took or why they made that determination. There's no justification, no supporting evidence, and no insight into the thought process that you know was behind marking this as a false positive. And without these details, again, there's nothing for us to fact check or peer review. If a related incident occurs six months down the road and we need to revisit this case, but we'll have no useful context to work with. If we need to reassess the decision later, we're just gonna be left guessing, right? Did the analyst misinterpret the evidence? Did they check all of the relevant logs? Without a well-documented investigation, we really have no way to validate whether this false positive determination was correct. Now let's look at a much stronger example, right? So in this case, the analyst went above and beyond here. After reviewing the alert, I looked at the Sysmon process creation or the event ID1 logs, which contained process information, including command line arguments. I confirmed that the source process was legitimate by checking the hash of the PowerShell.exe executable, they even include the hash value there, and verifying it on VirusTotal, which returned clean and Microsoft signed results, right? So this would be a great opportunity to include a screenshot of that report as well. I then decoded the base64 encoded command from the PowerShell script and found that it was running psformat.ps1, right? So we've uncovered the script name here. The script was executed by John Watson from the software development team. That's some good context, right? I reached out to John and confirmed with him that he did indeed run the script. He explained that he wrote it to quickly parse sets of log files for a new development project. See attached email thread, right? So we're including some more contextualizing information here. And whether or not, you know, uh, John should be allowed to run scripts like this arbitrarily is up to sort of the processes of the organization. This is just an example. 
After reviewing the script itself, I determined that the code was entirely benign, and the base64 encoding was simply used to encode binary log files, right? So we have some justification here. There were no signs of malicious intent or suspicious activity, so I'm marking this as a false positive and closing the ticket. Now, what example do you think was better there, right? <laughs> By documenting investigations in this way, we can create a much better trail of reasoning that we can reference later, right? If a similar alert appears in the future, another analyst can quickly see what was previously checked and avoid duplicating their efforts. And so the key takeaway here is to always provide justification and evidence for your conclusions. It strengthens investigations, it improves our team collaboration, right? And it ensures long-term visibility into security detections. And so I think that's all we have time for today. And of course, the list doesn't end here, but just as a general takeaway, we need to make sure that we're interpreting the evidence or the information that we come across, right? That's what we're paid to do as analysts, right? We need to interpret data and form relevant and specific questions about what we know in order to lead effective investigations. We need to make sure that we consider the context of our findings, right? We need to see how everything we discover pieces together and sort of fits together in that larger attack timeline. We can do that mentally. We also need to be aware of common abstraction pitfalls, right? And of course, to tie everything together, we need to make sure that we're good at documenting all of these findings and dispositions and ultimately our conclusions, right? If there are any other common mistakes or improvement strategies that you thought of while watching the video, be sure to drop them down below. And as always, I hope you learned something and enjoyed the video. If you did, be sure to leave a like, and of course, if you haven't already, subscribe to the channel for more videos just like this. And with that, I will catch you next time.